You might know her as one of the faces of PBS and as a veteran of the television news industry who's advocated for the role of women in the media. We'll talk about public broadcasting with Judy Woodruff next on Metro Center Outlook. This program is made possible by funding from the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida. Hello everyone, welcome to UCF Metro Center Outlook. I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies. Joining me today is esteemed journalist Judy Woodruff, host of the PBS NewsHour. We are at UCF's Center for Emerging Media in downtown Orlando, where students are learning the newest in interactive technology. I'll be talking to Judy about public broadcasting and today's media landscape, but first, Let's learn more about WUCF-TV, Central Florida's new home for PBS. Welcome to WUCF-TV, the new home for all of your favorite PBS shows, as well as the high quality local shows about Central Florida. Metro Center Outlook is a solid place to present the issues. Let's get what's out there and then people can decide and make up their own mind. As an economist, researcher, and educator, I take my news seriously. I need in-depth analysis, intelligent discourse, and fluff-free reporting. I have spent my entire career immersed in international issues and the topics, and it's just wonderful to be able to bring all of that together right here on the set. Today we're going to tell you how those old home movies are being used in a program designed to preserve local history. As you probably know, we came within days of losing PBS in our community. UCF, in partnership with Brevard Community College, stepped up to the plate to make sure that didn't happen. I watched PBS all the time as a youngster from the show Zoom to Sesame Street, so it's just a natural progression for me now now that I have my own children. I love PBS. I think it offers so much potential for kids to get excited about science. With NOVA and Nature and the other programs that are offered, I'm able to use that as a teaching tool. At times I do take lessons from PBS and use them, incorporate them into my classroom because every day a child asks a question and every time they ask a question it's a science question. The Antiques Roadshow gave voice to my passion. Get to know us and help us get to know you. PBS is the nation's largest public media enterprise that provides award-winning and educational programming to millions. But how does it hold up against funding struggles and the changing face of the media? Joining me now is journalist and one of the most recognized faces on TV, Judy Woodruff. Judy, welcome to the show today. Diane, I am thrilled to be here. It's great to be in Orlando. You have been in news journalism for more than 30 years, at least 10 of those with PBS. What draws you to public broadcasting? Well, when I, I was working with, uh, I'll tell you the story, I was working with NBC. I had covered the southeastern United States. I had covered the White House. I was doing interviews for the Today Show. And it was uh, 1983, and my good friend uh, Jim Lehrer and Robert McNeil, Robin McNeil, who had started this interview show on PBS, had decided they wanted to expand to a whole hour of news on public broadcasting. And at the time, it was revolutionary. Nobody else, the networks, commercial networks, had talked about it, but no one had done it. And so they got, they, you know, had to work at it, but they got permission from public broadcasting to go ahead and expand to an hour. And they wanted a Washington correspondent. And I thought, here's an opportunity to be on the ground floor Perfect of this whole new direction in news. And some of my friends said I was crazy. They said, how could you leave a network like NBC? But the fact is, it was a chance to try something completely different. And I could see, knowing Jim and Robin, that they had something groundbreaking in mind and that's what it turned out to be. PBS is the place that can do the stories frankly and stay with the stories that a lot of other places you know don't really want to stay with. You know they're looking at their watch they're thinking well a minute or two has gone by it's time to move on to the next one. 
but at PBS at the news hour we can spend time we can be thoughtful uh, well you're known for the quality we the try. quality of the programming that. and I think that the one of the things that PBS has maintained that image and actually the trust of the public how has that over the years they've still kept that in place well I give the the credit goes to Jim uh, Lehrer and Robin McNeil because their idea in the beginning was that there's so many important things going on in the world in this country and the American people deserve to know what those things are they deserve to be treated like the intelligent beings that they are they need to be told they deserve to be told both sides or all sides of a, of a controversial story whether it's politics business economics uh, science and let the public make up their own minds and that's really been the philosophy from the beginning well when you say the varied programming the arts the culture the science what role how would you define the role that PBS plays for the viewing audience I think we fill an absolutely critical role in American uh, information news gathering because what we do is we are not governed by how many eyeballs are glued to the set the commercial networks have to pay attention to if they put if they put an a, a game show on for example uh, or a, a talk show or something else and and people uh, want something that's faster paced or they want their reality show they've got to change the programming the philosophy of PBS is put a program on that you think the American people are interested in that they need to be informed and stick with it give it time to develop and and you will build an audience and that's what's happened with so the news hour. with the trend in the reality TV shows and shows like Dancing with the Stars you still feel that there is a viable market for educational programming absolutely I mean I think you know the American people always want to be entertained and there will always be an audience for Dancing with the Stars and so many of these other the so-called reality shows but it, but there are so many important issues facing our country our, your com our communities the world right now and with the news hour and I can speak best about the news hour because that's where I am our philosophy is um, figure out every day what it is that's going on in the world and in the country that the American people need to know to go about their lives to make the decisions that they need to make and it's not always clear what that is when we come in in the morning and talk about what we're going to cover on the show that that evening it's not always clear because there may be a lot of different things happening and other days there aren't as many so we've got to figure out okay how are we gonna what's the story that we need to go back to and shine a light on uh, but constantly in the back of our minds Diane is what do people need to know in order to be good citizens and and we know because we get a lot of feedback from our viewers what they think whether they think they've learned something whether they think we didn't cover it fully whether they want us to go back mm -hmm. to a subject whether they thought our debate covered the whole story or whether they think we need to hear another side of a story so so it's an ongoing dynamic process and increasingly an opportunity because of technology and the internet for people to let us know what they what they're hearing and what more they want to know with all the feedback that you're getting what is your perception with the American public do you think that they're still engaged wanting to hear the news or have people tuned out I think people are more engaged than they've ever been I think people realize that the country is facing crucial uh, where we're in a very challenging period right now with regard to the economy it, it's clear that structurally our economy is changing jobs that were uh, easy to find that were everywhere are now uh, have now gone away new jobs new careers new businesses are coming online um, ideas are in formation every day look at technology look at what you've got right here in Central Florida and the building where you and I are doing this interview this remarkable work that's being done in media um, so these are this is just one example of the kind of new economy we're moving toward the American people are smart enough to know things are changing I need to be smart in order to and my children need to know what's going on and so the need to me has never been greater and I think the American people realize that the technology aspect of it the web and social media has so much impacted the way we trans we cover news do you feel that that's been a, a relatively positive approach to things or what are your thoughts on that I think it's been a mixed bag because it's the technology has been faster than the speed of light if things are coming at us 
that we didn't even think existed or couldn't even imagine existing just a few years ago. Uh, I'm talking about not just the internet, but social media, things like Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. all these other um, uh, devices that we're carrying around now, the smartphones and the smartphones that, that you know, dial a phone number when we say, I can't work, you them. know, <laughs> call my husband. <laughs> um, so so it, it's hard for us to keep up with all that, and yet it's challenging us, it's pushing us. Um, at the same time, when you look at the content that's coming, on the internet and coming to us through these smart devices. I think it's difficult sometimes to sort out what's really a value and what is just fluff. And that's the challenge I think that we face. And it's a challenge, you know, we're all busy. We have, most of us have jobs, we have responsibilities to family, uh, to whatever we do every day. And to, to also be learning these new devices and learning what all they can bring us, it's, it, you know, it's dizzying. And so I think, you know, for all of us still, there's a learning curve. Certainly for me, there's a learning curve. When you talk about the content, do you feel that that wall between what is factual reporting and what is opinion with blogging and Twitter, has that become more blurred? It's absolutely become more blurred. I mean, it used to be when I first went into journalism, I was told to keep my own views out of it, that I'm there as an observer. I'm there to record, to report, what's happening and to share that with an audience, to write about it and to share, but to let the audience make up their own mind. Today, you know, fast forward 30 plus years since, people are, uh, many people have come into journalism thinking journalism is about something different, that it's about expressing opinions. And in fact, I have some young people say to me, well, how can you not say what you're thinking? Don't you feel passionately about some things? And of course, I'm human. I'm not. I'm not a machine, I have thoughts, I have ideas, I have emotions, um, but I think, but I continue to believe that the audience watches the news hour, they watch Judy Woodruff and my colleagues, Gwen Ifill and Jeffrey Brown, Margaret Warner, Ray Suarez, not to know what we're thinking, but because they want us to bring out the ideas and the views of the people we interview. Um, if they want opinion from journalists, there are other places to get that. I think and the danger should. is too kn knowing when it is fact. And exactly, when it is. and knowing the difference. And we try on the News Hour very hard to separate. And we bring on, for example, David Brooks and Mark Shields every Friday night to give opinion. That opinion, by the way, is based on solid reporting. I mean, they're not just sitting in an office somewhere thing, well, gee, I hate that or love this. I think this today. <laughs> it's, it's based on, you know, on, on real reporting. But I think I think journalists have to have to decide, you know, what kind of reporting they're going to do. Are they going to stick to reporting? Or are they going to be more in the opinion side of the business? And whichever it is, I think we owe it to the audience to be completely candid and transparent about what we're doing because we do a disservice when we keep people guessing. Well, you have developed a sterling reputation as a journalist and a reporter over the years. How have you done that? It sounds as if the, your your objectivity has been a key factor for that. Well, I appreciate your saying that, but my in my view, I've been so lucky to be in the business of news. I, I love covering stories. I love political news in particular. I consider myself a political junkie. I love covering it. I have to say today it's a lot more. It can be discouraging when you look at a system that is so divided and as polarized as it is right yes. now among many of our leaders. I have to say I don't think the American people are as polarized as many of our political leaders. So that's made covering politics that's a good point. more yes. challenging. Um, and by the way, you know, you use the word objective, you know, when it, picking up on what we were saying a minute ago. I know that I can't be purely objective because that would mean I, you know, I don't have any views personally. I do have views. But my job as a reporter is to keep those views away from the work that I do. And so I try to be fair and I try to be even handed. In, in reporting, and but I know that journalism. pure objectivity isn't possible. But but essentially, Diane, throughout my career, I've just followed what was interesting. I mean, I've been so blessed to work in journalism at a time. I started out as a reporter in the early 1970s uh, and have gone from covering uh, local news in Georgia, the Georgia State Legislature, Atlanta politics, a little bit of the civil rights movement. but but truly beyond that, a little bit of the women's rights movement, but, but focusing on politics, coming to Washington, covering the White House, and then covering presidents, 
from Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and now You've President so Obama. Things. It's been an extraordinary period, and look at how the world has changed. What have you noticed in the recent years in changes in the way uh, politics are covered? Mainly the speed of it and the quantity of it, that it's now, when I first covered the White House in, under Jimmy Carter in 1977-78, we had, we did an evening newscast on NBC, and we did a morning newscast, the Today Show. We did NBC Nightly News and the Today Show, and that was, those were the two deadlines. Today, with cable, with the, and especially with the Internet, deadlines are constant. You're constantly being ex expected mm -hmm. to report. It puts a lot of pressure on the journalists, and it puts extraordinary pressure on the, on the policymakers, the, whether it's the president or a governor or a mayor or whoever is making a decision, because whatever you do, you've got to be able to explain it instantly and you've got to be able to manage you know perceptions out there or at least try to manage perceptions it puts a lot more premium on thinking through how you make an announcement and who makes the announcement and what they say and on news that that gets out unexpectedly and how that's managed and i wonder if today's political leaders have the time to think through decisions that they used to have. It, clearly they don't. They are asked to speak about issues publicly often now before they've had a chance to really absorb them and study them. And so I think, you know, we are now asking our leaders, I think, to operate in a much more challenging, fast-paced environment. I mean, I, you know, we think back to the presidents we all admired, you know, from Washington to Lincoln to Roosevelt and the span of time that that covered in this country. And you think about, you know, they had time to go read a book or two. Not anymore. Before they had to go <laughs> talk to reporters. If they did talk to reporters, now they are constantly, they and their staffs are constantly being asked to explain. There's so much What did you mean by this? What yeah. happened at the, you know, when EPA announced this, you know, what did you, what did, why did you cancel that pipeline, uh, oil pipeline, the one that was going through ne Nebraska? And what was that all about? Was that politically motivated or not? And then there are questions about, not just about the environment, about foreign policy. Look at the world. It's a much more complicated place. When you have to be up on all of that as well. Of, exactly. And the media, we've got to be on top all, of the story as all, best we yes. can. So we, I, you know, in a way, we feel we're constantly playing catch up. Because, frankly, during the Cold War, there was the United States, there was the West, and then there was the Axis. The, the you know, as, as President Reagan famously or infamously said, the Axis of evil. Um, so my question is, you know, the question I have for many of us in journalism is can we keep up with the world as fast paced as it is? And the answer, I believe, is that we have to be candid with our audience. If we are only beginning to try to understand a story, whether it's the rapid changes in the Arab countries, in North Africa and the Middle East, whether it's what's going on in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, we need to be candid with the audience and say, we're just now getting to talk to the generals or we're just now talking to people on the National Security Council staff because we can't possibly be a hundred percent informed on something that's just happened. Well, one of the um, other things, one of the other key right. roles that you've played is you've always been an advocate for women in the media and yeah. I know in the early 90s I believe you founded or you co-founded the mm -hmm. International uh, Women's, Women's media. media Foundation. Right. What is the mission or the, the purpose of that group? Well, I'm glad you asked me about that, Diane, because it's something that's very dear to my heart. It's the International Women's Media Foundation. A group of women journalists came together uh, in 1990, late 1980s and 1990, and looked at the fact that democracy was starting, it appeared then at the time, to be breaking out in different parts of the world, in South Africa, in the Philippines, certainly in Eastern Europe. And we looked at all these countries that were moving toward democracy and knowing that when that happens, the, the role of the press changes. They go, the press goes from being completely under the thumb of government to having more opportunities to be open and free, but still with constraints from government. And we know that in those situations, women often want to have an opportunity in those media, new media environments, but they often don't know how to do that because they haven't been given an equal role or even a close to equal road, role in those societies. And so we wanted to basically start an organization that would, would reach an, uh, an ex an, a hand of opportunity to women journalists around the world and say, you know, whatever state of 
free press or not free press that your country is in, your, your press is in, we want to be here as a resource, a resource to lift a, yeah. to, to offer a hand to you, uh, and to be here as a as a place to, you know, to uh, to turn to for advice and frankly to learn from you. And we've done that. We've we established the so-called Courage and Journalism Awards. We've now given out over, I believe, fifty or sixty of those in the in the years, sixty of those in the, the twenty years that we've been around. Actually, that came out last year. That's um, right. And one of the, the interesting facts that I pulled out of that was that 73% of the top management media jobs with the news and media are still held by, by men, men. That's right. only 27% by women. That's uh, amazing to me anyway, but it, a glass ceiling, how do we overcome this? It is interesting because yeah. in journalism, women have come a very long way. There's so many more women now in front of the camera, you know. Yes. Uh, and even behind the cameras, uh, camera operators, uh, newspaper editors, people we s see on the air or don't see in print, broadcast, and online. Many more opportunities for women. But at the top levels of management where decisions are made about what stories get covered, who gets hired, who's fired, who's promoted, who covers a story, too many of those decisions, I believe, are still made by men. Some progress has been made, but we still have a long way to go. And that report that you mentioned that the International Women's Media Foundation sponsored, a look at a global look at the yes. role of women in the media, That's quite I think interesting. It shines a light on the fact that women still have to push uh, to make sure that we play that important management uh, and decision-making role in the media. Now, you've received so many different awards one of the most recent was the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the Edward R. Morrow School of Broadcasting. What plans do you have? What do you want to do for the future? To me, the, the opportunities are endless, Diane. I mean, there's so much more. As, lo as long as I've been covering politics, and I've been doing it for a long time, and I've been in Washington a long time, there's still so many things out there that I'm interested in. A few years ago, for example, I worked on a couple of documentaries on the younger generation, studying the so-called millennials born after 1980, they are truly different from any other generation. My sons would tell you that. You're, my children, they are, they are more diverse, they have different ideas about openness in society, they're much more accepting of gay rights, uh, they are just, they, they want to be a part of, of a, a, on the forefront of decision making, they want to be the boss quickly, they don't want to wait 30 or 40 years, they don't want to wait their turn. Um, and they are closer to their parents yes. than any other generation. So just learning about that generation reminds me what, a, what an amazing world we live in, how opportunities are changing, and anything I can do to, to help shine a light on that generation, on the so many important stories that are out there for the American people, that's what I want to do. I plan to keep working as long as I can. Good, good. Thank you, Judy. It's been delightful to talk with you today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, and good luck to WUCF. Thank you. I've been talking with Judy Woodruff, host of the PBS NewsHour. For those at home, you have a chance to keep the discussion going by weighing in on our interactive website. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees. This program was made possible by funding from the Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida.